Hello from Hong Kong again. Welcome back to the VPAC International Conference 2020. Nani, are you a digital native? Do you have to ask me this, John? Being millennials, we're surrounded by technology and interactive devices since birth. So, of course, we're a generation of digital natives. You're right, Nani. We have the digital skills we need for workplace, but I'm sure there are more than that. Our next session is AI, data analytics, cybersecurity. Are digital skills enough for workplace? Do let us know your views during the discussion. The convener is Mr. Tony Tai, Chairman of the Vocational Training Council, Hong Kong. We'd like to invite the following panel members to join the discussion. Mr. Thomas Leubner, Head of Global Learning and Education of Siemens, Germany. Ms. Sophia Leung, Managing Director of J.P. Morgan Chase, Hong Kong. Mr. Peter Liu, Managing Director of Asianet Consultants Limited, Hong Kong. Mr. Ron Tam, Co-Founder of Clinic One, Hong Kong. Please join me to welcome Mr. Tai and the panelists. Thank you, Nani and John. And welcome to all our panelists and delegates. And a special welcome to all those joining us online. We are delighted that you can join us for this panel session, focusing on our digital skills enough for workspace. Today, we have a very good mix of panelists. Now, we have Thomas from Siemens. Siemens, as you know, is a leading technology company. So they know well ahead of what technologies are coming. So we're going to listen from, uh, from Thomas about the automation, digitalization, and all the plans to develop talents in Siemens. And technology is impacting a lot of the industries. A lot of people, in fact, are saying technology is disrupting a lot of the industries. And financial industry is definitely one that is heavily impacted or disrupted. You got to hear about FinTech. So they group all the technologies that impact the financial industry into one single category. <coughs> and today, we are very ha happy to have Sophia from JP Morgan Chase a leading international finance company to share with us how they are tackling this advancement of technology and how they prepare their staff to face this technology um, impact to the company and to the industry. At the same time, we're also seeing that a lot of the companies are talking about digital transformation. So when they recruit executives, Will they be looking for people with different set of digital skills or experience in digital transformation? So we are very happy to have Peter from Asianet, an executive search firm, to tell us more about what the employers are looking for. And of course, we should not miss the startups. Mm -hmm. And we are very happy today to have Ron. Ron is a young Hong Kong entrepreneur and also our VTC alumni. Oh. He is the co-founder of Clinic One, very successful startup in Hong Kong. And I'm sure Ron would provide us the views as a startup founder. So thank you all our panelists. Now, before I invite our panelists to share their thoughts, we'd like to get all of you to get involved, even virtually, so that you can be part of our discussion. So please think about the questions or things that are related to this topic. So we'll also be talking about how we are going to educate more talents, what education institutes can do, and how we are doing retraining, upskilling about our existing staff. I think these are all essential challenges to the existing organizations. So please, whatever you think about questions, ideas related to this topic, please send all this in. We want to be as interactive as possible so that we can pick up some of your questions so that we would be able to get and ask the panelists to talk about some of the issues or ideas that come up from you. 
So let us have our first polling question. What comes to your mind when somebody says digital skill? As you can see from the question, what are the top digital skills to master the future of work? I'm sure different people would have different thoughts and different ideas. So we have all the lists here so that you can pick from and then we'll see which one comes out to be the most wanted uh, digital skills to master the future of work. So we need your input. Please tell us what you think in this poll. Now, may I invite our friend from Germany, Thomas, to share with us key skills for the digital world, the learning focus for future growth for Siemens. Thomas, over to you. Thank you, Tony, for your kind words. Good afternoon from Munich in Germany. You see that I'm uh, here in my home office. Uh, so we are now uh, still in a situation where nearly all of the white color workers in Siemens are working from home. But uh, thanks to the great IT infrastructure, uh, this is absolutely possible and not a problem. And I can also tell you that uh, the production as well as uh, the sales in Siemens is working fantastically and uh, we are coping very well with the situation. So as you said, Siemens is a global engineering company. We are active in more than 180 countries around the world with 380,000 employees. Our products are a wide range uh, of uh, systems and services from energy system, power plants, automation, smart cities, railway systems, healthcare equipment, and digital solutions. Uh, currently, we see a very uh, new development uh, that is driven by the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is uh, uh, the option uh, to have machine-to-machine -machine interaction. The Internet of Things combines the physical world with the digital world and uh, topics like uh, big data and artificial intelligence based um, new solutions and services for our customers are uh, now possible and bring completely new way of uh, value add to our customers. Uh, of course, uh, because of these changes in technology, we are looking constantly uh, into the system to learn what are new skills and competencies uh, that are coming up and that are relevant for us uh, in the area of education and learning. We are using the trend radar, which uh, is basically based on a new technology. We are looking what kind of new technology is coming up, what are the specific uh, skills and competences that uh, come with the Internet of Things applications. We are looking outside, for example, towards Coursera studies uh, to see what are the hot skills in the market. And of course, we are looking uh, in our emerging skill analysis into the labor market in order to understand what are the hot skills and competences that are searched for in the market. We see six buckets of new topics coming up or currently relevant topics. This is fostering customer value creation, applying digital technologies, leading entrepreneurship, driving innovation and learning, collaborating in a new way, and uh, how to do business in a new age. So these are the buckets. I want to give you some examples. Next slide, please. So for the first uh, bucket, fostering customer value creation, you see that uh, here we are already way beyond only technology skills because it's all about how to bring uh, value to our customers uh, that are now using our new digital solution. So we need to change something in our sales approach. Uh, then, of course, we have the wide array of technical skills, understanding Internet of Things, digital edge, cloud computing, and so on. Leading entrepreneurship is extremely important because also our business models are changing. And with the changing business models, we also need to have a better understanding of how to do business in this new digital world. Next slide, please. Driving innovation and learning is an, a topic that is uh, per se uh, important. That means uh, how to do, uh, how to develop digital products and services. Design thinking is one of the methodologies that help us to drive in innovation. 
collaborating in a new way and how to do business uh, in the uh, times of digitalization, of course, also require quite a lot of new skills and competences. Next slide, please. So this is a quite broad array of new skills and competences that we need to deliver to our employees, but also to our apprentices and dual uh, students. So to give you just an idea of what we are doing here, at any given point in time in Siemens, we have more than 10,000 apprentices and dual students that are working for us while they are learning. So the dual system in Germany is basically uh, based on the idea that you are already an employee when you start learning, you already get paid also, uh, and you go through a curriculum that is exactly targeted towards our needs. We spend every year 500 million euros for education and learning for our employees. And uh, we have a system that combines uh, the theory, the theoretical learning, uh, the on-the-job learning, and the learning in a safe environment, which is a training center, where our people can practice new skills and competences in a safe environment where they are also allowed uh, to uh, make errors, uh, to do something wrong and learn from uh, uh, these errors uh, very quickly without uh, harming uh, the business or themselves. The um, theory uh, currently is moving away from the picture that you see here, which is a typical classroom uh, auditory uh, situation we are providing 15,000 uh, uh, cost-free um, e-learning modules. Um, we deliver this through an e-learning platform. Uh, each and every uh, apprentice, dual student and employee in Siemens have access to the learning platform and they can learn everywhere, whenever they want, using their mobile devices. 15,000 offerings free of charge and targeted exactly to their specific learning needs. Yeah, next slide, please. I thank you very much for your uh, attention. I just want to end uh, this uh, little uh, keynote uh, with a message. The, the dual education system as we know it and how we are driving this in Siemens is a triple win. It's a triple win for the learner because the learner learns and earns money and has a very smooth uh, transition uh, towards uh, the workplace. It's a win for the company because we get great talent that is exactly educated for the workplace uh, in Siemens. And of course, it's a win for the society because young people uh, find uh, relevant jobs in a relevant industry and uh, industry uh, and, and uh, the societies grow whenever their young talent uh, have a good uh, and, and uh, reasonable uh, work to do with uh, also very good payment. So thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Thomas. Very comprehensive um, delivery of the, the Siemens, what's happening in Siemens. Um, and I noticed that you you're focusing very much on on-the-job practical skills. And at the same time, earlier this morning, uh, we heard from one of the speakers from uh, Swinburne University that Siemens do have a cooperation program with them. So what do you expect the education institutions to do while preparing graduates that can fit into the company, fit into more work ready, in a sense, versus what some of the things that you have been doing? Yeah, so uh, we have a very close relationship uh, to leading colleges and universities around the world. Um, and uh, for us, it's really essential that uh, the education providers understand our specific needs. So we are sitting together and we are discussing the curricula and the content uh, of uh, the delivery that comes uh, from the universities, from the colleges, um, and we uh, gain a mutual understanding of what can be delivered from uh, the education provider and what uh, can be delivered from us on the workplace. 
uh, if uh, and, and we we are very successful in um, uh, synchronizing uh, these uh, two efforts in order to have the maximum effect for the learner. Thanks, thanks, Thomas. Um, this morning we have also heard a lot of speakers talking about working and learning integration. So I think that's exactly what Siemens doing. Uh, but they also mentioned that work is changing faster than education. So a lot of the times we are not catching up. So I think the involvement of industry in education systems is, is very important. So Sophia, are you doing a lot in this area as well in yeah. the organization? Well, we, we uh, work with a lot of universities um, mm. on our internship program. So this is whether people are doing a three-month summer internship program or um, sometimes there are work placements uh, for the school year. And that really closes the bridge between people studying something in school to making that useful at the workplace. Mm. And it also opens the eyes up for students who think like, technology is really boring and you're sitting in a computer you know, programming all the time to what it feels like to do a job. So I think you know, closing that gap between uh, students who are studying and understanding what a job is in technology versus doing something at work is very important. And we continue to work with many universities and professors on that. Great, great. Thanks. Ron, in, in your, since you're an alumni, I understand you always come back to help us. Mm. Um, are you also working with um, a lot of our, our staff in, in helping them exactly what the industry is about and what you need? Yes, yeah, so uh, actually in the past three, three years, uh, we uh, developed an internship program, which is quite special in my point of view. Because I, uh, as an alumni from VTC, mm. I know what uh, the students uh, uh, are taught by the t uh, tutors and I know how familiar it is, is the course of the uh, content of the course. So uh, actually I designed a um, program or model for the internship students is uh, we uh, build a project and build some work uh, workshop for the student in the first two weeks and then students can learn from our staff or even uh, we have our instructor, instructor in, the, in the company. And after that, we will have some mini project for them mm. to build a lot of really, we will publish to the, to the public, uh, say a mobile apps. Uh, it, maybe we can have some proof of concept idea and we, uh, the student actually can work by themselves and build something a really facing to the world, but mm. uh, a lot rather comparing, comparing it in the school, they only do something, assignment, workshop, and it's not uh, matching or facing to the world. So uh, we provide a uh, workplace for them to have this kind of experience. Great, great. I think this is really great. I, I had some feedback, in fact, from, from some of the students mm. having attended this company attached to program and they, they are telling me that uh, it's very different from what they learn in <laughs> yeah. school. So I think this is very, very good. So thanks, thanks to all. So let us move on. Uh, I would like now to invite Sophia to tell us more about the role of technology in your organization, in JP Morgan, and how, the, how you need top talents across a range of technical and also soft skills. Sylvia, please. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take the next couple of minutes because I guess most of you probably are just familiar with the money you get out of an ATM machine <laughs> right, uh, from a bank, and so you may not be too familiar with what is technology in a global financial institution. Um, so number one, technology will continue to enable our business. It really is transforming every job in the bank, and it is the backbone of our company. Um, we're committed to staying ahead of the curve by investing in platforms and applications that allow our clients to have a better experience with our bank, as well as lets our own employees, we have 250,000 employees at J.P. Morgan Chase, do a better job in serving our customers. What does that really mean? So let me give you an example, and that's why I put one chart up that only has a couple of numbers. Um, number one, our firm is investing uh, 11, over 11 billion US dollars in technology every year. Um, that is a lot of money. <laughs> I, I, that's a lot of money. And we actually, as a, even a bank, we have over 50,000 technologists around the world um, who are doing a variety of different skills that I'll talk about a little bit more. We need so many people and so much technology. You think about that. 
I put one number up, which is um, our bank is processing right six trillion U.S. dollars a day through the world. This is like you can't afford to have things go down because you're talking about moving money around six trillion dollars a day, and also our systems need to be very scalable, very stable, and very secure, right? Because I think all of you know now, there's a lot of fraud, there's a lot of security concerns. Also, you can't allow your systems to go down when you're, you're sending them out, like right now, maybe, I don't know, we lost, uh, we lost uh, Germany, but um, it has to be very secure. So we're talking about systems that have to be up 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, we are committed to investing in any technology that helps us achieve this mission. So what does that really mean? It means we will provide the networks. So if you're an infrastructure, for those of you who study IT, we have a network as big as, a, I think, a telephone company in the US. Uh, we have application developers that are hard coding. The, the, the traditional people think you're sitting in front of a computer and you're writing code. We have people who are doing UX design. So when you're using your mobile application, we want to have client experience that really is, is, is very differentiated. So, um, or they do very leading, uh, bleeding edge technology, leading edge technology like blockchain, the, all the buzzwords you hear about, or artificial intelligence to enhance what we do. Um, so we will invest in any technology that will help us achieve this mission to uh, both uh, serve our customers and operate globally. Uh, we also operate in something like 100 markets around the world. So what does that mean really, aside from technology and all the different parts of technology are important to us, whether it's software, hardware, uh, user experience, you'll, you'll hear a lot about these things that are important in a great product. Think about when you use your application, you don't want one that's really hard to use, you want ones that's easy to use, you want security, you want all these things. Um, so when I think about the talent part, right, because without the right people, you will not be successful. So we are actually very focused on how we both hire and attract new talent, whether it's students or lateral hires. Um, we're also very focused on training and retraining all of our staff. Um, number one, I mean, despite the fact that you could be the best student in school, we're looking for, though, the people who are the most motivated, enthusiastic, and capable of demonstrating that they're learning. Because despite the fact that you can study really hard if you don't continuously learn, and if you're not motivated and enthusiastic, I would say it's very hard to be very successful over time. So we're looking for people who are enthusiastic, motivated, um, have a thirst for learning, but who also have competency in both. You, can, you have to learn the, the business, which is financial services. You have to learn coding and other harder soft skills. So we, we, we look for that type of talent. In addition, um, I also offer that we spend $300 million a year in training and development because technology is moving so fast. So you can't just learn and pretend you're, you're not going to have to learn. So there is a lot of uh, uh, learning. Um, and, and to be honest, we don't have to force people to learn because people know to be successful, they're hungry to learn. Mm -hmm. So in fact, sometimes we have to think about the budget that we're providing <laughs> and learning. Uh, but learning doesn't only come in the form of a classroom because there's so much IT uh, learning online. Uh, we also offer learning in, in, in the ways of hackathons, right? So we'll throw a problem out, have people you know, buy some pizza and have them spend a day uh, coding a problem um, and other ways. So I would say um, the training and retraining and attracting talent is very critical for our bank, and we're very committed to that. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thanks for your very wonderful presentation. So uh, after hearing both from Sophia and Thomas, you probably noticed that training and development is a big business that you can go after. Maybe Ron, that's the next thing you should think about. Um, well, uh, well, let us look at some of the uh, some of the online questions. This one is very interesting. Um, what do you think about AI replacing jobs at the workplace? Now, this is very interesting because this morning we also um, have seen, or oh, AI, um, we have also talked about this and then there are a lot of mentioning about technology getting rid of jobs but at the same time creating a lot of jobs. So maybe I, I take this chance to ask Sophia and Thomas, in your organization, do you see jobs being eliminated and at the same time new jobs being created because of technology? Maybe Sophia? Yeah, I think technology and AI in that is enhancing every job. So previously, I give for example, um, one of the IT 
you know, uh, jobs that we have is you need to support the systems, right? And you have people looking at a screen, looking at patterns to know what to do. Well, we know that technology can solve that, right? So I think, I think it, in, it is enhancing many jobs and also enhancing the way that we uh, uh, perform our jobs and, and serve our customers, so overall. And also AI and those, th those type of technologies are also helping people learn. So I would say the digital skill for everybody is important. It is enhancing most jobs, I would say. Mm. Thomas, your will? Yes, uh, so I give you two examples. Uh, so uh, for example, Siemens is uh, doing the maintenance of railway systems for our customers. Uh, in the past, you had certain schedules uh, when to maintain a locomotive. Uh, and once uh, the date was there, uh, some people went there and changed uh, some parts uh, and brought into the locomotive spare parts uh, without knowing the exact status of the locomotive. Today, we are using big data and artificial intelligence to determine uh, what is the best time to do what kind of maintenance. And this changes uh, the whole uh, pattern and also the trade of a service engineer completely. Uh, because now all of a sudden the service engineer is not the guy who goes out uh, with, a, with a spare part, but is the guy who takes um, a look at a large number of uh, different uh, data sources, locomotives uh, uh, or uh, other uh, systems in the railway system, and then determines uh, 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 proactively uh, want to, uh, when to do what uh, as a maintenance task, which saves a lot of money on the one hand, but it also raises uh, the availability of the locomotive uh, to an unprecedented um, uh, percentage point. That's uh, a typical service example, but we have, of course, also very similar examples uh, in uh, typical white color functions like in our purchasing department, while in the past a lot of effort went into determining market prices for certain products or commodities. Now this is done by artificial intelligence. Uh, there is a vast, uh, a vast number of uh, data points going into the system and the system determines exactly what is the best price point for a certain uh, specification of a product and then gives a recommendation to the buyer when to buy what and uh, from whom. Uh, so the whole process is not only much more transparent and uh, much more optimized uh, to get the best price, but it's also much more um, efficient and we can save a lot of buyers. At the same time, of course, in both uh, examples, new jobs are also built because those people who are able to do, to work with the artificial intelligence, uh, to develop it, uh, to uh, really use it uh, in the process. Uh, these uh, people are now uh, the ones uh, who have fantastic career opportunities. Thanks, Sophia and Thomas. Um, so we need to learn because of this new technology. So for new jobs going and coming, so we have to do that. But how about um, the requirements of digital transformation for a lot of the companies? Are we seeing that um, we need to look for more technical, competent leaders to lead the company into those technology innovation? So may I ask Peter, you are very familiar because a lot of people uh, come to you when they need help. So do you see that is a trend coming for recruiting executive that this becomes a much more important requirement? Well, I haven't done serious research in terms of uh, large sample size, but based on the work that I do, uh, mind you, most of uh, my candidates are earning in the range of, maybe just pick a ballpark figure, about 500,000 US dollars a year. So it's about uh, 4 million Hong Kong. Now at that level, um, I don't think it's a, that person has to be technically savvy what the employers look for um, is whether that person uh, will embrace the changes, whatever that change uh, come along, rather than trying to stick to his or her own uh, self-belief as to how the world, at least the business world, ought to be. Uh, it's the mindset that is the most important thing. Um, and, uh, and also, 
whether the person, the leader, is proactive as opposed to reactive. Now, this is very, very difficult to train. I think uh, over the years, you, uh, I, I shouldn't say you, you were born with it, but earlier on in the formative years, you're either a reactive person or a proactive person, maybe the way you were brought up. And, and being proactive is priceless. Mm. And also being flexible is also priceless. Uh, and flexible in terms of uh, working with different people, uh, you cannot just simply go in and say, uh, at a junior level, um, you can pick and choose the company you want to work for. Uh, let's say if you apply to be a management trainee of a British company versus an American company versus a Hong Kong or a, a, a China company, you, you have a choice. But as you move up the, the management ladder, uh, the successful ones tend to be able to adapt uh, uh, in a given environment. They know one person simply cannot change the culture of the entire company with a lot of history. So long story short is, again, uh, proactive, uh, uh, be willing to embrace uh, uh, new things. Uh, and I'll give you an example. When I talk, uh, talk to uh, one person that I'm going to attend a VPAT conference this afternoon, therefore we have to reschedule. Now, that person didn't know uh, what VPAT was all about, but instead of asking me, he quickly pulled his smartphone and typed it. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. Now, that is, uh, he is uh, in his 50s. Yeah. So, but instead of relying me to tell him what VPAT is, he is basically a curious person. He would take the initiative, just simply pull out his smartphone, <laughs> and fine. Mm -hmm. Everything is available on the internet. Uh, I shouldn't say everything. A lot of things mm -hmm. you can learn from the internet. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So, uh, well, in the interest of time, uh, let us look at and review the first pro answers. Yes, okay. So, artificial intelligence, big data comes up top of the list. So, uh, panelists, any comments? Is this a surprise to you? Or that basically is really one of the most important things? Um, well, I think there is a general shortage of that. And like every, it's, it's mm. like digitization, everything's going to have some level of AI in it in the future. So, I think it's not a big surprise. Mm. Okay. Ron? Uh, actually, I will have some idea uh, during my presentation later. But actually, I w per in my point of view, I would say that digital project management skills uh, for me mm. is the most important skills for everyone. Because a lot uh, we are, when we are talking about AI, big data, those I think those may only uh, cover for those technical people only yeah. or te technologists in the industry. But for general public, I think. Uh, digital project management, I think in every industry, every kind of uh, role, role in, the, in the company should be a skill for the employee. employee. Good. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ron. We will hear more from you uh, <laughs> later. Uh, well, let us, let us look at, um, at the same time, look at uh, the second polling questions. How would you boast your digital skills? So uh, for all the attendees, please give us your choice. Um, this is the, the last polling, in fact, uh, that we're going to have. How would you boast your digital skills? On the job training, online training, classroom, and th this morning, a lot of speakers also talking about all this information, just like Peter said, is available on the internet. So uh, would it be like that, or you would prefer to do on-the-job training or self-study via free online resources. So we, we want to hear from you. So um, let us move on. Uh, I understand we have a number of BTC students uh, joining today's online conference. And I think our students are looking forward to the sharing of Ron as our alumni to tell us about his own experience in running a startup and the challenges and the necessary skills that uh, he, he's uh, looking for. 
So Ron, over to you. Yeah, so while waiting for the PowerPoint screen. So uh, let me introduce myself first. Uh, actually, as uh, Tony introduced myself, uh, I want to say uh, in my past, actually, I'm the first generation of DSE in Hong Kong. So people call that a, the, the white mouse <laughs> <laughs> in Hong Kong. So uh, after that, I uh, chose to study the first uh, cloud technology course in IBE. Uh, in Hong Kong. So uh, after graduate, actually, I go to the Hong Kong U to study for the computer science. So in the earlier days, I was trained as a programmer, as a cloud engineer in the early days. So, uh, but during the university or during my life of students, I actually observed a student learn and share culture uh, was promoting over the world. Uh, in the previous years. So uh, when I have this kind of uh, insight or uh, I, I, I was being promoted by s some students over the world, and I chose to assemble a uh, joint, university com uh, joint university computer association in Hong Kong. And uh, being, being with the ch president of the association, I uh, was quite lucky that I, I can assembled the uh, eight university in, uh, from the Hong Kong, and we have uh, around more than 200 student members uh, at, the, at the years of 2014. So uh, being the president, I decided to organize a first ever uh, student IT conference at 2016, that year. So um, uh, during that two years, uh, actually uh, as a student, and a, and a student uh, president of a association. Actually, I spent a lot of time to learn some presentation skills, uh, corporate communication, because uh, uh, by organizing the event, the conference, we have to uh, find some sponsorship from the industry. So uh, I was, I would say I'm quite lucky that I uh, was supported by Microsoft, uh, Amazon, and even some uh, startup and SMB in Hong Kong to uh, holding this kind of student conference at that use. So uh, I learned a lot of things. And after that, I decided this is a chance and opportunity to start my own business. Uh, before the company, actually, I have been working for a freelancer as a software developer uh, uh, quite a long years. And then I start my uh, staff company in 2016. And that's, uh, I will have some uh, screens to share my own experience to start a company. So why I start a clinic one, this kind of company? So uh, I would like to say uh, nobody knows what is sick care and health care. The differences uh, in our own opinion is our healthcare, healthcare system in the world is focusing on the treatment disease. Mm -hmm. We're treating the disease when we are getting sick, but we, are, we do not take care about our body. Uh, in the long days. But that's why the cost of health insurance keep increasing, increasing. And uh, we can uh, uh, foresee that we will spend a lot of money when we're getting older and older. So treatment to cure illness is not only the costly, but we also add the suffering to the equation. So a better method would be a disease prevention, prevention from improving health and wellness. So this is what we are doing. We really care about the health. So we designed a patient journey, which is a digital transformation uh, for the healthcare industry in Hong Kong. So I would have some example later. So uh, I'm not going to go through this in details. Uh, simply for sim simplify that Clinic One is a care platform. We build some solution for clinic. We build a mobile app for patient. We store and manage or analyze the healthcare record in the cloud. And even we need to integrate with in enterprise, say insurance company, hospital, and the government. And we provide a clinic management system for the clinic in Hong Kong and hospital in Hong Kong. And uh, this is our future, uh, as we can see, health wallet. Health wallet is a health record uh, inside our mobile apps or inside our mob uh, mobile phone. 
So we basically, basically we build a pl blockchain platform to store all, all our health record mm. and activity in, in, the, in the cloud. And this is telehealth platform nowadays uh, during the crisis. Uh, lots of people in the world, a lot of doctors in the world are adapting this, but actually we have been promoting this for four years. So the Hong Kong Health Check Group, uh, medical group is our uh, biggest, uh, largest spawn, uh, supporter in Hong Kong. We build a lot of uh, digital signage, queuing system, and then uh, quality healthcare, we build um, patient mobile apps for their digital transformation project. So uh, after to, uh, building this kind of solution, uh, I would like to say uh, I'm the people who born in a generation of internet. And for the youngster, they are in the generation of mobile apps. Mm -hmm. And I believe that not all of the people nowadays can make use of internet because I believe that, uh, I will share my own habit, is that I can go through all the posts in the social network every night. And we have, I have three kind of level because uh, I, uh, first one, I want to learn from the world. I need to build up my international insight. So I go through all of the news in the world. Mm -hmm. And second is the business sense. I need to go through all of the posts in the LinkedIn platform to see what uh, the company in the world are doing. Mm -hmm. And the third one, I think the most important is the social activity uh, because I need to take care about the social, ta uh, social issues in the world or even in Hong Kong. And I need to take care about what my friends or family are doing. So in this three level of uh, category, actually I can uh, have a lot of information every day. And this is why people want, uh, always ask me, Ron, how can you learn and know lots of things uh, in, in so frequently? So this is my own habit. And my last one, this last one I want to share is, um, as you can see, I'm, the pe I'm not the person who, who can uh, keep in traditional uh, uh, in a pathway or career. I'm the people person to break the rules, think of the boss. And I would like to share with the youngster nowadays is go learn yourself. Uh, because internet, on the internet, this is a knowledge base. And go find your own answer. And always prepare yourself and then be a digital person. So that's why I'm not saying so those digital skills on the list is uh, so necessary because I think uh, the person yourself, you, you need to it. be digital. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Hey, thanks very much, Ron. Very, very interesting uh, introduction. Uh, I think all through the day, we have listened to a lot of the speakers talking about um, teaching versus learning. I think from a young person's perspective, I think Ron has given us his point of view about the, the younger generation today, how they look at digital skills, how they acquire digital skills. So this, I think, is a very interesting point for us to look into when we further develop our education system to meet the future uh, workforce. Um, thanks very much, Ron. And uh, I, I also read about, uh, hear from you, that during your startup, Besides digital skills, in fact, you have to do a lot of selling, you have mm. to do a lot of convincing. So it's also a lot of social professional skills that you require in, in achieving that, that work. Great. So uh, now I would like to um, open the questions for audience and also from online. So first of all, maybe um, we, when we come to this Q&A session, let us look at uh, and invite questions from the floor. Um, anyone from the floor? Yes, thank you. Hello, I'm Katie from VDC. I would like to uh, ask that do you have any advice for uh, students who are not familiar with digital skills and communal skills to enter this industry? Thank you. Yes. Maybe, maybe I ask Sophia and then Ron. <laughs> yeah. um, there are so many types of courses that are offered now, right? Like online, free. I mean, you know, you can pay for classes, of course, but I think there's actually quite a bit of online learning. You can learn to code. Um, there's uh, a lot of online resources. I think you can um, definitely take advantage of those type of e-learning and online learning to see if 
uh, first you like it and also to give yourself more exposure to those things. Like just make sure you have a level basic. I mean, we've been promoting as well with um, the school system, secondary schools, etc., that they really need to uplift the level of training that they provide all the students during the school years. But there's a lot of training, as I talked about, outside um, on the internet, etc., that you should take advantage of. Thank you, Sophia. Ron, you? Uh, I would say digital skills, as I, as I said, uh, is not really necessary, but the communication skills is the most important uh, for everyone. Because nowadays, uh, we can use AI to translate your language. Language is a lot of problem, but when we uh, communicating with the uh, people you are working with, and even you need to presenting yourself, the communication skills is the most important, even when you are doing a job interview. In, if you <laughs> cannot present yourself, so uh, what kind of job can you get? Yeah, so uh, I think Sophia mentioned there are a lot of available uh, learning two systems in, in, in the internet that you can learn from. And Ron earlier saying that you just go and try. You just go and use it, communicate with people, and then you, you learn from it. So I, ho I hope that answers your question. Any other questions from the four? Just before we move to online. Hello, I'm Yiling, and I'm from RTC, I want to ask a question about any special digital skills you find the most important when you're looking for talents. Um, we shall graduate soon and will enter the work of enter the role of work. And um, any tips for us? Thank you. Maybe maybe I'll ask uh, Thomas. Any advice what kind of digital skills required is this a VTC student? Mm -hmm. So uh, first of all, yeah, yeah. so uh, first and foremost, uh, we are looking for applicants who bring with them a genuine interest and also uh, skills in uh, science, in mathematics, uh, in basic uh, uh, digital skills. So it's not necessary to already bring a very specific skill with you because in our dual education system, uh, you will learn what is needed at the workplace. But uh, the basics need to be here. Uh, so that means a good understanding of mathematics, good understanding of physics, interest in engineering, and also, of course, uh, reasonable school grades in, in these areas, uh, together with the willingness to learn and of course, you should be able to work with uh, digital um, uh, uh, and, and, and mobile um, uh, 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 systems. Uh, so you should be able, uh, for example, to follow up on a virtual classroom uh, using your notebook or your iPad. Uh, and you should be open uh, to learn everywhere, uh, wherever you go, and uh, to access uh, our learning platform and our e-learning offerings. Thanks. Thanks, Thomas. Now, let's turn to our online system. This one very interesting uh, question from uh, Chow. Digital technology destroys some jobs, but create new jobs at the same time. How can the relatively low-skilled personnel prepare themselves to remain competitive in the market? So this relates to upskilling and also reskilling. So, Sophia, any advice? Yeah. Mm. Well, I think many, many companies, I mean, hopefully, like, are, are helping their employees continue to, you can call it upskill, mm. reskill, or just be skilled, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, I think the most important thing is you have to look at it as the need to learn. I mean, technology now, from when I started, is very different, but it's still technology, and it will keep changing. So I think you know, for the students that you keep learning and you don't think that going to school is when you learn. Like it's a lifetime continuous learning and I think that mindset is very important. I think one last bit about this is, and I think going back to what he said is, because of the availability of information and the way we can solve problems, one key skill that I think is very important for the future is how someone solves a, solves a problem and solutioning, 
right? So no one, we can teach you how to do something once, but every problem that you see doesn't have a solution. And the people that are truly successful, I think, are the problem solvers. Mm -hmm. You can use any tool you want. I mean, now you can look up anything. And like, for instance, we had a staff who was trying to do something, and he kept doing it, and he found it really tiresome. And so he learned to code in Python. Mm -hmm. He went online, learned Python, <laughs> and created a script. And that shows a lot of motivation to really solve a problem. So like, if you haven't thought a, a little bit about that, I'm sure all employers really look for employees that are very resourceful and focused on the right problem to solve. So um, I think that, that you know, is not a low skill, high skill person mm -hmm. because I think you can be skilled up pretty mm -hmm. quickly. Thanks, thanks, Sophia. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. This is interesting. Um, from uh, Emmet. In the fast changing digital world, what roles should educators be playing to nourish, nourish students at the early schooling to develop caliber of flexibility, adaptability, self driveness, etc.? Maybe, Peter, any? Suggestions? Um, it's very uh, relevant questions, very broad. Um, I think is in a digital world, uh, I would, if I were to mentor some young students, I would not encourage them to uh, rush into something, learn digital because everybody else is doing it. You have to know your own strengths. If you don't have the aptitude, let's say uh, Thomas mentioned about their company is looking for uh, uh, graduates with math, math skills. Now, uh, I'm not looking down upon some people. Some people are very strong in math. Some people are very good in languages. So if everybody's learning math in order to become AI savvy, but you're basically a language person, then, then even if you learn some basic AI, you still cannot compete with them uh, in the job market because they are way ahead of you, the people that are strong in AI skills. I remember the old saying, you look at my gray hair, I belong to the analog generation, <laughs> thinning hair. Um, when we were looking for a job at the time, uh, there was an old saying, the person who know the how, how to do something, will always get a job. But the person who know the why will always be the boss. So if, you, if you're not a how person, try to be a why person. Uh, everybody has their own niche. And that's why it's important to talk to your career counselor. Make good use of the student support services. Because using them as a mirror can help you reflect and understand your own strengths and weaknesses. Don't try to be... A, a, a geek, computer geek. If you're not born, if you're not wired like that, even uh, Steve Jobs, he is not a, a technical geek, but he knows how to put together a package, and here comes the iPhone. He's not. He wasn't the person that developed all the software to support, or even the hardware to support the iPhone. But he had a sense of the market and put all the packages together and hiring the right people. And he knows the why. So just a thought. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks, Peter. Sorry, the, there's one question really that comes up that I really would like to, even though a bit, we are a little bit ahead, uh, I mean out of time, but then I, I think we, we still want to tackle this, is from, uh, from T. Lai. I'm concerned about cybersecurity privacy policies regarding online medical system. I think the same applies to the banking system as well. <laughs> uh, so sometimes feels unsafe. Please share some suggestions on the topic. Thanks. So I would, I would pose this question to Sophia and Thomas uh, for a short answer on that. Any advice? Um, well, there are a lot of regulations. <laughs> right? So the, um, all the global regulators around the world have policies now if you're trying to be a bank um, just to keep the security of you know the customer information make sure that you're gonna put money in a bank that we can secure it so um, now of course I don't think regulations is everything it's a very complicated matter now 
especially when you talk about different countries. So in fact, I mean, this is a very big topic for uh, companies. In fact, we, I think there was an estimate that um, for cybersecurity, people are spending 40% of their time on policies, compliance policies, versus protecting the bank from bad guys. So um, it's, 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 not, uh, it's not a small topic. Sometimes feeling unsafe, that's why um, at JP Morgan we say the most important thing we protect is our reputation. Mm -hmm. Because no one wants to do business with a bank that they don't trust. Mm -hmm. So you're right, to be successful in this business, you have to invest in the right security. And, and for us, you know, we have no limit to how much money we'll put on security because it is a business of trust. So. Yeah, sorry, Thomas. I just really want to add a point here because I think this question is uh, system, yes. a question uh, my customer asking me every day mm -hmm. uh, because uh, those uh, medical group practice, uh, hospital, uh, and even government are really concerned of the medical record on the cloud. So I would say uh, security or cybersecurity is always a concern, even nowadays or 10 years. But I would say the value added after we put it into the cloud or even we uh, share, share the, uh, the record or data to somebody to make mm -hmm. use of it. I would say this is a balance of besides security and the value added uh, or even the AI analytics after what we can do. Mm -hmm. uh, we, would should, we, we should put some more focus on the value in the right. future, but rather the, of course the security is important. We need to put lots of resources, money, investment on it, but uh, just want to uh, focus on the value added. So sometimes it's a trade-off yeah. in a way. Thomas, anything to add on? Thanks, Ron. Yeah, look, uh, Siemens products control critical infrastructure. Think about a railway system. Uh, this is not only a material asset. Uh, here we are also talking about uh, the lives of many, many people uh, which we need to protect. And if you would have a hacker uh, uh, bringing the security in the system out of balance, uh, there would be huge damage. Therefore, for Siemens, uh, cybersecurity is a top priority, and we do everything to make sure that our systems uh, can be protected against uh, yeah, people who really want to harm our systems. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Thomas. Well, uh, to conclude now, all the answers are in to our second polling question. So the, can we have that result on, please? <laughs> oh, so on the job training gets the highest mark and then self-study through free online resources mm -hmm. and online training. Oh, that's great. I, I, I think we, we, throughout our discussion, we have covered a lot of this. So. Um, Maybe let me take this opportunity uh, since we are running a little bit out of time, overrun. So I hope all of you get some great ideas. Uh, my short summary to our session really is digital skills are essential, but they are not enough for success. So you still have to ha have other social skills, um, other professional skills. And the best way to get onto those skills is you go and try to learn throughout your day-to-day -day action. Uh, at the same time, we need industries to work very closely with the education institutions so that we know exactly what's happening in the industry, what kind of skills is required in the industry. And also, at the same time, uh, I like Ron's idea that we need to really think about not just from an educator's perspective, what is required, but also from the learner's perspective, how they look at skills, how they look at um, some of the, uh, the, the things that we worry about in the cyber area. And then we start off to plan our new learning systems. Uh, that would be more fruitful, I think, to the younger generation. So thanks very much, everybody. In conclusion, I would say that digital skills really matters, but then they are not the only thing that matters in the workspace. And I, I hope as I said, industries and educators would work more closely together so that we can develop people with the right skills, the right value system, and the attitudes to drive the world forward. Again, thanks so much for everybody for your participation. Thanks very much for all the panelists for your very informative and interesting talks and ideas. And to the dedicates, thank you again for your active participation. Hopefully, this session has provoked some fresh thinking, and we all have some new insights to take home with us. 
Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Mr. Tai and the panel members for the wonderful showcase of ideas. Thank you all for joining us online. We now have a short break. As the saying goes, good things come to those who wait. I'm sure you'll agree with me if you come back after the break. So see you all again soon. See you.